Our next speaker is Dr. Bob LaPerrier. He is the curator of the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society Museum of Medical History. And he is also a retired dermatologist um, from Kaiser Permanente. Uh, as a reminder, add your questions to the chat, or we'd love to hear your voices. Raise your virtual hand. I'd love to call on you. Um, and Dr. Bob will answer questions as we go along through his presentation on the history of medicine in the Sacramento region. Um, so Dr. Bob, please take it away. Thank you very much. I enjoyed listening to the last part of the former presentations and kind of reminded me that physical chemistry and physics were almost my downfalls in pre-med. I've been, <coughs> excuse me, I've been retired 23 years now, so I'm a little ways away from medicine and got involved uh, decades ago in the medical history because it does give us an appreciation of how far we've come in actually a relatively short period of time. Now, the beginning of uh, basically medical history in the Sacramento area was related to Gold Rush. And on January 24th, 1848, James Marshall saw something shiny in Sutter Creek near Coloma, California. He discovered gold while overseeing construction of a sawmill on the American River. So began the influx of thousands of gold seekers to a new and rugged frontier with no infrastructure to cope with such a crowd, no public health measures, a region described by a first comer as one of the most healthful territories in the continent with a climate unrivaled in purity and equability, nor is sickness that scourge of humanity here to harass us and hinder us in our pursuit. But with no public health measures and minimal hygiene, within a few short months, the gold rush immigration produced a collecting point of health tragedy not to be equal to any other place in the world. Doctors did arrive with the gold rush, many in the hope to find gold themselves, but more likely to find disease and suffering and be stimulated and challenged to resume their dedication to the practice of medicine and initiate public health measures. Now, the first medical society in California uh, was formed in 1850, and it was a medical surgical association. And the CH surgical is the British spelling for surgical. Next in 1855 was a Sacramento Medical Society March 12, 1856, the California State Medical Society began, which was the very early beginnings of the California Medical Association and the beginning of California's organized medicine and health care. The Sacramento County Pathological Society then began in 1858. Well, five years later, by 19, 1863, uh, all of those organizations had disappeared. But by 1868, the physicians had gained a lot of knowledge and organization, and many of those involved in the former organizations formed the Sacramento Society for Medical Improvement, which later became the Sacramento Eldorado Medical Society, and now is the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society known as SSVMS, which represents the counties of Sacramento, Eldorado, and Yolo. Here's an image from about an 1895 publication by the Sacramento Bee showing some of the physicians of that era. Our medical society has been in continuous operation since 1868 and is the oldest county medical society in California based on continuous years of existence. Now, one of the reasons for the formation of our medical society was to protect the people from the irregular physicians. Now, looking back to the 1800s, uh, there were allopaths, and they were the regular physicians like we'd consider an MD today. There are also Chinese doctors and herbalists because of the large Chinese population here uh, that built the railroad and also the levees. In fact, it was a Chinese herbalist who saved the wife of Governor Stanford. Then we have irregular physicians. 
Uh, and those are the ones that Med Society was trying to protect the community from. Eclectic physicians were those that took a little bit of knowledge from all the other fields of medicine. Homeopathic, and if you go to a health food store today, you'll see it's still around. Homeopathic was a thought that if you gave a very minute amount of a substance that would produce the same symptoms as a disease the patient had, you'd dry the disease out. Thomsonians uh, were big advocates of using herbal medicine. Hydropaths basically uh, use water externally and internally profusely. And in fact, we had a hydropathic a doctor in Sacramento in the mid 1800s, uh, pretty much in the location where the Sacramento History Museum is. And interestingly enough, her name was Dr. Waterhouse. And then we had the impositors, people who'd worked in hospitals as maintenance men, even janitors in the Southeastern United States, thought maybe they learned enough to hang up a shingle and start practicing medicine during the gold rush. Now the allopaths are the regular doctors learn medicine both through medical schools and three, through preceptorships, which was working with a physician for several years until they felt comfortable enough to open their own practice. The irregulars did have a large following because their use of cupping, bleeding, puking, and purging was minimal. And you'll hear a little more about those treatments shortly. Now here's a list of some of the physicians from the mid 1800s, late 1800s in Sacramento, uh, where they came from. Dr. Thomas, Thomas Logan, I have two favorite physicians from the 19th century. Dr. Thomas Logan was a brilliant man. He uh, kept the first records of deaths and morbidity, mortality, but he also kept the first records of weather and for almost two decades, he kept these so accurately that when the National Weather Bureau came into existence, they accepted all of his records. He was also quite an artist. We have Dr. John Morris, a very good looking young physician. Uh, he was a very prolific writer, uh, again, a brilliant physician. Uh, unfortunately, he left Sacramento after a while to move to San Francisco. And he wrote the first history of Sacramento City, which is a fantastic read. And it has been reprinted a couple of years ago and the Medical Museum does have copies of this for sale. You can also purchase it, I believe on Amazon, but it's well worth the read. And it's not the first medical history. Dr. Logan wrote the first medical history of Sacramento, but this was the first history of Sacramento City in general. Then we have people like Dr. Harkness, and we still have a school, Dr. H.W. Harkness Elementary School, named after Dr. Harkness. A lot of the early physicians were very involved in education. And we have Dr. Dixon, a railroad physician. We actually had three railroad hospitals in Sacramento because the railroad for a very nominal fee uh, provided medical care to all the people employed by the railroad. And of course, in the 1870s, the uh, railroad was running to the East Coast and back. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the gold rush. Two routes from the East to California for the gold rush. One was overland by wagon train pulled by oxen, a 2000 mile trip that took four to six months. The other option was over water by ship, either across Panama, uh, crossing Panama by foot, and then picking up another ship on the other side of Panama, or going actually by ship totally around the tip of South America, which are very treacherous seas. Again, about a 16,000 mile trip that took four to six months. And when you consider the lack of knowledge of the cause of most diseases, for instance, scurvy and cholera, the lack of knowledge of microorganisms, though they were first noted in the 1600s, it was not until Louis Pasteur in the 1860s developed the germ theory that they were related to disease. When you consider the lack of knowledge of the benefits of hygiene and pure water, 
and the lack of most of the medications we have today, uh, such as antibiotics, heart medicines, diabetes medications. You can imagine the results, hardships and disease, even before these people arrived in California. Not knowing much about disease and its prevention, most were not familiar with edible plants and root and did not take many necessary items with them, nor were they able to carry adequate clean water. And there were numerous sources of diseases along the way, and even more for those that came by ship and crossed Panama by foot. For instance, yellow fever was a scourge at that time. Now, this is a quote from an overland diary, and it gives you an idea of what the drinking water was like for those, like for those people coming across the plains. Our drinking water is living. That is, it is compressed, composed of one-third green fine moss, one-third polywogs, and one-third embryo mosquitoes, and these we strain through our teeth. Another quote from a diary, the amount of suffering in the latter part of the route was almost incalculable. I saw men sitting or lying by the roadside, sick with fevers or crippled by scurvy, begging of the passerby to lend them some assistance, but no one could do it. Consequently, they were left to a slow lingering death in the wilderness. Now, uh, if does anyone know what scurvy uh, is or what it's caused by? Vitamin C deficiency. Correct, very good. This is a picture of uh, scurvy from an 1800s medical text. And if these people were aware that taking and eating lemons and limes and oranges and other fruit and vegetables with vitamin C would protect them from scurvy, they would have, but they did not know the cause. You can also imagine the results after their arrival as Sacramento's population suddenly jumped from 2,000 to 10,000 and a quarter of a million people suddenly poured into California and fires and floods swept over Sacramento. Most were not prepared for the hardships of coming west and arriving in California for the gold rush. 6% died in the overland trek to California. And it said one out of five who made the trek would die within six months of their arrival in Sacramento. Well, the 19th century was an era of treating the patient because this was the only option. They didn't know the cause of disease and therefore they could not treat the disease as we do today. As this was an era before immunizations and antibiotics, childhood diseases were a tragedy and numerous children never made it past two or three years of age. <clears throat> now to give you a good feeling for what illness and medical care was like in the 1800s, this is an original letter we have in the museum. It was written in approximately 1820 and it was written from the relative of one of my patients to another relative of my patient. And it's uh, one of my patients who presented this letter to me. And part of it says, on the 6th of September, I was seriously attacked with a bilious fever, also threatened with a dropsy, which is swelling like swollen ankles. My physician thought it impossible for me to bear a run of the fever, and he commenced breaking it on Sunday by bleeding and puking, which was continued on Monday. I was partially deranged on Sunday, which was followed by a state of mental madness caused by excruciating pain about the crown of my head, the most agonizing torture that experience could conceive or tongue describe. I had my head shaved and blistered, one also upon my neck, my back, my bowels, one upon each arm, one upon each leg, eight in number, all sore at a time, very large and inflamed, yet the chief evidence I have of the existence is the scars upon my body. A partial derangement succeeded madness. Three months are lost to me. Time appears like an almost forgotten dream. 
I must turn from the subject. The recollection of it chills my blood. I view this affliction as a punishment for an abuse of reason. My nerves are still irritable. My health is tolerably good. Well, as you see here, the ones in white, bleeding, puking, and blistering were three out of the four modalities of physical treatment. The one not mentioned is purging. <coughs> Well, medical, medical care was not the only challenging aspect of medicine, so was surgery. With no knowledge and or belief in organisms, infections were deadly, and it was not until the 1860s that this started to change. And anesthesia was not discovered until the late 1840s and not commonly used for some time after. In addition to the lack of adequate treatment for medical diseases and the lack of anesthesia, surgery itself was at best primitive. And this is a picture of one of the three Civil War era amputation surgery kits that we have in our museum. <clears throat> you can see a little curved saw on the bottom right. That's a Hayes bone saw that was used to cut a hole in the skull. Whereas a tree find, the two things that uh, are round up at the upper left uh, were used to drill a round hole into the skull. If there an injury and blood was pressing in the brain, this would be a way of relieving it. <clears throat> well, the most common operation, need for amputation was frequent a procedure going back centuries. If a fracture penetrated the skin in what we call a compound fracture today, the mortality rate was about 100% due to infection, whereas a mortality rate of amputation was 50%. So one of two patients was saved by amputation. <coughs> and it did nothing but get worse. Some of the diseases during the gold rush included yellow fever, which was picked up crossing Panama, malaria, typhoid, typhus, malnutrition, encephalitis, and many more, including the childhood diseases. The pictures at the bottom, the left two pictures are measles and the right picture is smallpox. The two grave markers you see, you notice, have lambs on the top. And this was a way of noting that the person buried underneath that grave marker was a child. And again, it did nothing but get worse and worse. The New World ship brought cholera to Sacramento, killing about 1,000 Sacramentans and 17 physicians in three weeks in the fall of 1850. And this frightening description is from a medical textbook of the era. Cholera generally commences with vertigo, headache, and singing in the ears. We find the lips, nails, and sometimes a whole skin of a blue color. The attack to the disease in extreme cases is so sudden that from a state of apparent good health, an individual sustains as rapid a loss of bodily power as if they were suddenly struck down the countenance assuming a death-like appearance, the skin becoming the coldness of the skin of a person already dead. And to add to the frightening aspect of cholera was a mortality rate was about 50% and often death occurred within 24 hours of onset. The rapid spreading of the epidemic gave to the physicians no rest day or night. They were falling like the foremost soldiers of a desperate charge. And ere this cholera season had subsided, 17 of their number were deposited in Sand Hill Cemetery. And yet not one educated physician turned his back upon the city in its distress and threatened destruction. This was a quote from a writing by Dr. John Morse. No monument of marble records their heroic deeds, but their memory shall remain in the pages of history of medicine of California, an imperishable legacy to the profession they have ennobled and adorned. And this was a quote from the writings of Dr. Thomas Logan. <clears throat> and here's a list of the 16 
uh, physicians who died of cholera while remaining in Sacramento to take care of their patients. There was one additional one whose name we do not know. And there's only one who has a gray marker and we know where he's buried. The others were buried with the other thousand people who died in Sacramento and we're not really sure of that location. <coughs> Now I mentioned the big four, bleeding, cupping or blistering, puking and purging. The picture to the left is a glass cup that would be used by uh, putting a little piece of burning flannel or material in it, putting it in the skin, the fire would go out and create a suction and create a blister. On the right are two of the many instruments used for bleeding. The top one is a fleam, which would be used to cut into a vein, such as the vein in the fold of the arm. The bottom is a little more attractive unit. It's a scarificator. It had 12 round blades that were spring operated and would suddenly make 12 incisions in the skin for bleeding. Now, why bleeding? Well, this goes back to Hippoc Hippocrates, who was called the father of medicine, uh, almost two centuries before the gold rush. Hippocrates said there's four humors in the body, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And if they're not in balance, you get sick. And if there were too much blood in the body as they fell causing a disease, you would bleed the patient. Also frightening in the 1800s were the medications used, arsenic, strychnine, mercury. Well, this has been a very brief introduction to medicine and disease during the era of the gold rush. A lot we didn't talk about, leeches, maggots, trauma, tuberculosis, malaria, and dozens of other things. <clears throat> well, before the pandemic, we were able to tour you through the museum and you would fill out a scavenger hunt quiz. We'll now use our virtual version to learn more about items in the museum. The main medical museum website with lots of virtual experiences is at ssvms.org slash museum and the QR code if you have your smartphone handy and want to scan it will lead you to that site and uh, uh, Lindsay we could we could take a few questions before I get into the scavenger hunt sounds good um, I, I think there were lots of groans as you were <laughs> going through <laughs> some of the infectious diseases and some of the very interesting instruments that were used without anesthesia. Uh, but I didn't see any questions unless somebody would like to unmute. But I, I do want to say one thing now. We are going through, uh, we are going to do a virtual tour of the museum right now with the scavenger hunt. Um, but when you all visit us at the medical at the medical society on Friday, July 2nd for our final session in person, our museum is located on that property and we will um, be we're trying to figure out how to prepare and allow you to do some tours through the museum as well. Um, so does anybody have any questions for Dr. Bob before he gets into this uh, interactive portion of his presentation? They are stunned, Dr. Bob. Oh, <laughs> we got one. We have one. Was mercury widely used in medicine before or after the gold rush? Uh, during and after the gold rush, uh, mercurial preparations uh, were used, not the metal mercury, uh, but things uh, that were composed of mercury and mercury salts. And again, of course, we know now they're toxic. Most of these toxic agents were used in very, very small amounts uh, and, you know, ultimately would accumulate and could be toxic, uh, particularly the case with arsenic. One little dose of arsenic might be okay, but it accumulates in the body and eventually causes uh, many, many problems. And someone asked for the museum link in the chat and Sam has provided that if you guys wanna click on the link, but do participate in this portion of the presentation first. Okay, now I just need to figure out how to get to the next part. So you were stalling for time is what you were doing. <laughs> I'm on to you, Dr. Bob. <laughs> <laughs>
you guys really the the medical museum it's it's pretty awesome that um to walk through our front door we have to go through a small portion of the museum to get into our offices so every day we have the pleasure of passing by the uh iron lung that still works and um i don't what dr bob is the iron lung a part of your presentation i won't go into it if it is uh it is yeah okay then i'll then i'll be quiet but it's actually very cool and there's a doll in it i'll leave it at that Okay. Dr. Bob, would it be easier yeah. if Sam opened it up and shared her screen? That might be because part of the Zoom bar is blocking my access Got to it. Safari. Okay, go ahead and stop sharing. Sam, I you just shared the link, so I figured you would be able to do this more quickly than me. Yep, she's already on it. Look at that. Fantastic. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate that. <laughs> Now the scavenger hunt is a, uh, however, it's not wanting to respond. Um, just tell her when you want to go to the next slide. The next Dr. slide. Bob. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, the entrance to the museum, we have Sadie, who uh, was in the museum before the museum started. She's an actual skeleton. Next. Next. Oh, question number one. And if you have your audio on, uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask questions as we go along. Now, we have one of the few iron lungs on exhibit anywhere in the United States. And does anyone know what the iron lung was used for? Polio. Right. And does anyone know what type of polio it was used for? And there were two types of polio. There was the type that you see most commonly where it affected the arms and the legs and the muscles. And there was a bulbar type where it affected the basically the brainstem and prevented the patient from breathing. Next. Next. Now here's a picture of kids affected by the most common type of polio uh, with braces and wheelchairs, very, very common back then in the 1950s. It was caused by a virus. And as I mentioned, there was a bulbar and the other type next. Now, the way it works is when the diaphragm at the foot end of the iron lung pulled out, it would actually pull air into the patient's lungs because the patient was totally sealed around the neck in the iron lung. So it was basically a negative pressure ventilator. Next. Now, what can be used today instead of an iron lung? There's a variety of modern ventilators uh, the most common ones are used in the hospital, for instance, in, in COVID, but they require that a tube be stuck down the throat and then the tracheal tube uh, or a hole in the neck, a tracheotomy put in. Uh, at times, positive pressure ventilation can be used just with a face mask to allow oxygen to be forced in the lungs, but they're more compact versions, the iron lung, that fit just around the chest. Uh, so people do not need to be in an iron lung. Next. <clears throat> a little bit more about the iron lung. Uh, some people were in it for weeks, for months, 
they would recover. Others were in it for a much longer period of time. Uh, there have been several people who died in the last five years who were in an iron lung for at least 50 to 60 years. And of course, it was very confining because your whole body, including your arms, were inside the iron lung. So you could not feed yourself. You could not uh, help yourself to drink. Uh, you could not hold up a book to read. So it, it had to be extremely, extremely difficult to even uh, live for a couple of weeks, let alone your whole life in an iron lung. Next. Okay, leeches. For what purposes are leeches used? Comments? Nope, that was just me saying that I'm really, really glad we have the uh, polio vaccine. Because <laughs> that, that sounds like absolute torture, um, having to uh, live your life basically in a giant coffin with just the opening for your head. Can anyone tell me what leeches are used for? <clears throat> well, leeches bleed. They are very kind. They inject a little anesthetic so you don't feel them. They inject an anticoagulant to make it easier for them to remove blood, which is one to two teaspoons a day. Next. Now, we talked about Hippocrates. Next. These are a couple clues. So to remove blood, if you thought the patient had too much blood, you could use some of those instruments that we showed, but you could also use a leech, which would remove one to two teaspoons of blood. Next. Now, leeches are used today. Does anyone know why they're used today and by whom? Guys, if you know the answer, just unmute it. Uh, it's taking too long to type it out. Anyone? Okay, they're used by plastic surgeons. If a plastic surgeon reattaches something like an ear or a finger that's been cut off, or if he does what's called a flap, which is something to cover a wound where maybe cancer was removed, they can attach the little teeny blood vessels to get blood to that area. But for the blood to get back into circulation in the body, the body has to do this and it takes a while. And therefore the surgery area may swell up and of course, if it swells up with too much blood in it, it'll cause gangrene and be lost. So the surgeons will use leeches. Next. Now leeches are produced in one place in the United States, in New York by a company called Leeches USA. And they produce all the leeches used by plastic surgeons throughout the United States. Here we see some of the other instruments. Uh, again, you recognize the flame you saw before. The upper right picture is a spring lancet, <coughs> like a flame. But if you weren't gutsy enough to cut through your own skin, that was spring operated. Next. Here's a better picture of the scarificator. Next. There's references to bleeding even after 1900, but it's been used back to the days of Hippocrates. And of course it can still be used in conditions where too many red blood cells are created, but only for a very specific condition like that. Next. Here's a picture of a leech that was applied to a site of plastic surgery. Next. Next. And just to comment, the scavenger hunt we're going through now is fully online in the Medical Museum website. So if you want to repeat any of these slides, or we will not have time to probably go through all of them today, you're welcome to go back to the Medical Museum website and continue on your own. Also we have many, many other things on the website, including a half hour uh, tour of the museum with my narration. Uh, we have uh, pictures of almost 500 of our artifacts with a description of them. Uh, so there's enough to keep you busy for hours and hours on our museum website. 
Now, what instrument would be used to look at germs and blood cells? I think you all know what that is. Anyone? Microscope. Right. Uh -huh. Now, these are some things you'd see with a microscope. Uh, the left picture shows Clostridium, which is the bacteria that causes food poisoning. And the right shows uh, malaria parasites, Plasmodium vivax, amongst red blood cells. Next. Micro, of course, means extremely small or minute in scope or capability. Next. And here are just a couple of the many microscopes we have in the collection in the museum. <clears throat> Next. A Dutch father-son team named Hans and Zacharias Johnson invented the first so-called compound microscope <coughs> In, excuse me, in the late 19, uh, 16th century. By the late 1600s, improvements to the lenses increased the quality of the image and the magnifying power to up to 270 times, paving the way for major discoveries. In 1676, Dutch cloth merchant turned scientist Antony van Leeuwenhoek further improved the microscope with the intent of looking at the cloth that he sold but inadvertently made the groundbreaking discovery that bacteria do exist. Next. One use of the microscope was to do blood counts. The unit to the left is a hemocytometer. You'll see a glass slide in the middle. There's a glass tube below it and a rubber hose around it. And when I was in medical school in the 1960s, we actually occasionally would even use these to do blood counts. You would basically uh, poke a little hole in the finger and you would suck the blood up uh, using the tube into the glass pipette, put it into the glass slide, put the slide under a microscope and you could count the number of cells and the differential of the different types of blood cells. Next. <clears throat> Certain instruments let doctors look inside body cavities. Does anyone know what this technique is called? And then can you think of an, go ahead. Is it x-rays? No, no, that would be uh, looking from without the body, but this is actually looking into the body. Like a uh, colonoscopy or an endoscopy? Right, endoscopy, very good, perfect. Now, give an example of what you can look at using one of these instruments. Uh, can you name a couple of organs or areas that can be examined this way? Well, someone mentioned colonoscopy, so the colon would be one. Think of any others? Your small intestine. That's a little difficult to look into. Actually, someone uh, a decade or two developed a little capsule you swallow that has a light and a camera and a transmitter in it. And it transmits the picture of the inside of the small intestine as it goes through the intestine. Uh, but there's uh, something called a gastroscope. Gastro refers to stomach. And let's have the next slide, please. This is a cystoscope. This would be used to look into the urinary bladder through the urethra. Next. And you're right, endoscopy. Laparoscopy refers to looking into the abdomen with an instrument inserted through a small incision. And the first ones back in the 1950s, 60s, <clears throat> were basically to examine the inside of the abdomen. If there were trauma and you wanted to see if there were bleeding from the spleen or the liver, you could do that with a laparoscope. Uh, older instruments were optical, meaning they had a rigid tube, a light and an eyepiece. Of course, modern instruments are smaller, flexible and have a miniature camera. Next. Next. 
Now we talked about the organs, uh, cystoscopy, looking into the urinary bladder, stomach, looking into the stomach with a gastroscope, or a colonoscopy, looking into the colon with a colonoscope. Well, more recently, surgery can actually be performed with scopes. And first it was done directly just with the scope, such as removal of part of the stomach or part of the colon. Next slide. Here's an image, however, of what can be done today using robotic laparoscopic surgery. And this means the physician is not even near the patient. The patient would be in the table to the right and the two surgeons are like they're playing a video game, actually operating all the instruments and viewing through the scope what's going on with the patient. And it's amazing what can be done. Uh, a friend of mine had three quarters of the stomach removed. It was done in four hours, just laparoscopically, no big incision. And the patient was home in under 48 hours, unlike weeks, which would be the case before when you had to open the whole abdomen. Next slide. And this is a picture of one of the instruments that would be used. This would be a forcep. Next. Okay, what is quackery? Anyone have an answer for that? Is quackery still around? Isn't it like, sorry, isn't it like, unhonest medical claims that like something can do something that it won't. Exactly, exactly. Uh, next slide and we'll clarify that, but that's perfect. The definition of a quack, uh, the word quack solver had its origin in 1579 and referred to one pretending to have skills or knowledge, especially in medicine. Next. Next slide. Next slide. Is it frozen, Sam? Uh oh, maybe it's frozen. Oh, there it goes. Next slide, Sam. Okay. Next slide. Good. Oh, back one slide, please. So quackery and you were right is a recommendation or use of instruments, drugs, and other items that claim to cure a remedy condition, but have <coughs> no beneficial effect and may even be harmful. Is quackery still around? Yeah, you can see it advertised in magazines, newspapers, and television today. Next slide. Okay, two of the many units in our uh, museum. The one on the left is a magnetoelectrical unit. You'll see two uh, little metal cylinders. The patient would put a finger into each of those cylinders and have someone turn the crank, the white crank at the bottom. It would produce an electrical impulse that according to the book it came with would cure dozens and dozens of conditions. Now the instrument to the right is a violet ray machine. And those are glass tubes filled with a gas such as argon. They plug into the handle, which is at the top. You'd plug it into the wall and you'd see a violet glow to the tube. And if you put the tube directly in the skin, again, it was claimed it would cure pages and pages of, of different disorders and diseases. If you backed off a little bit from the skin, it actually would send a spark to the skin. Next. Okay, does anyone know, anyone know what these are? <clears throat> Any thoughts? 
Okay, next slide. They're all heart valves. When was the first artificial heart valve inserted? Which cardiovascular surgeon in Sacramento developed artificial heart valves? And there's a clue down there, a Smeloff valve. Dr. Smeloff was a cardiac surgeon in Sacramento and working with California State University, Sacramento and Sutter Research Institute in the 1950s developed one of the most effective ball and cage, which is a type of heart valve, a ball and cage heart valves ever designed. The heart valve to the left is more of a flap type valve, like an open and closed door, as opposed to the ball and cage. The ball and cage, basically, when the blood came in, it would push the ball up and let the blood go through. And then when the heartbeat relaxed, the ball would fall back and close that valve. Next slide. <clears throat> well, the first artificial heart valve was in 1952 by Dr. Huffnagel. Uh, 1960 was the first valve replacement using open heart surgery. But various other types of valve replacements were done before that time. <clears throat> and after that time, the last couple of years, a valve has been developed now that can be inserted uh, folded down through a vessel in the thigh and pushed up through the vessel into the heart and put into the heart without doing open heart surgery. Next slide. Again, Dr. Smelnoff, and that's a better picture of one of his valves. Next. Does anyone know what this image is? EKG. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. an image from an EKG. Next. <clears throat> what does an EKG measure? Anybody? Um, is it your heart rate? It measures a heart rate, uh, but more specifically, it measures the electrical impulses of the heart. The picture you see here had to be probably the most common EKG machine ever made. <coughs> I say that, <coughs> excuse me, basically because we've had five or six in our collection and there's one on exhibit in the museum now. Next slide. <coughs> Now, lead one is a basic lead in an EKG that will show you the rhythm of the heart. But there's five other leads. Uh, most EKGs do a six lead EKG, and they show other aspects of the electrical activity of the heart. And that's where you can make a diagnosis of a heart attack. Next. Dr. Bob, yes. um, just uh, giving you a, a five minute warning before we have to end for the day. Um, so if, if anybody has any questions uh, for Dr. Bob, start preparing them now because we'll be answering them after this question. Okay, very good. Next question, bacteria cause many diseases like pneumonia, tonsillitis, and tuberculosis. <clears throat> what types of drugs are used to treat these diseases? Anyone? Antibiotics. Correct, antibiotics. Next uh, slide. Antibiotics, antibio against life. This word was first used in 1860 and described as an, an opposition to the belief in life beyond Earth. Next. Antibiotics such as penicillin, erythromycin, tetracycline, and numerous more recently discovered and potent drugs uh, are pictured below. It's a medicine that inhibits the growth of or destroys microorganisms. And of course, I think most people are most familiar with penicillin because it was the first antibiotic. It was developed in the 1940s 
although penicillin mold had been discovered about 10 years before. Penicillin was very important in the Second World War, uh, very, very difficult to produce, very limited. In fact, people, particularly soldiers who were treated with penicillin, had to save their urine so they could remove and purify the penicillin from the urine because it was so rare. Of course, we've got tons of other antibiotics now that are many much more effective than penicillin uh, and attacked a lot of different organisms. Next. Uh, we can, we got three more minutes so we can cover this question number nine. What was the first true antibiotic? Next. And this is repetitious from what I just said. That's a clue to the name of the first antibiotic discovered, penicillin. Next. And here are just some pictures from our collection of some of the early days of penicillin. Bicillin was an injectable penicillin that would remain in the body for a week or two. The crystalline penicillin was used in pretty much small doses compared to the way we use penicillin today. Next. Next. As I mentioned, penicillin had been discovered earlier than it was purified. It was discovered in 1928 by Fleming, but 1938 is when the technology became available to go ahead and purify and produce it. Next. Okay, uh, good time to stop. Uh, first of all, a reminder that we're through probably only about half of the slides on the scavenger hunt. So by going online, you can review the ones we did if you're interested, but you can also go ahead and view uh, 10 or 15 more slides that give you information and pictures. So I'll now open it up to questions. <clears throat> and thank you, Sam, for uh, doing that for us. Any questions? Got to be a couple of questions out there. Looks like there's just a lot of thank yous uh, to Dr. Bob for your awesome presentation. And if they do have any questions, Dr. Bob, hopefully um, you or a couple of the docents will be available at the final session on uh, July 2nd because the students will actually be in person at the Medical Society. Uh, so maybe some might want to actually take a quick peek at the actual museum. And okay, look yeah. around. Um, so I don't see any questions, Dr. Bob. Again, thank okay. you so much. Thank you, students, for, for um, your participation. Um, before we let you go for the day, um, you should be receiving in the mail with items for activities for future sessions. Um, so if you haven't received your kit uh, today or by tomorrow, please let Sam, Sam, would you please put your email in the chat function real quick? Please let Sam know that you didn't receive it so we can try to get one to you. Um, they'll, they'll help you with for further activities, especially for our pharmacy day and our day with the pathologist. Um, so thanks again for joining. One, one, one more comment. If sure. you can provide, if it's not provided, my museum uh, email address, ssvmsmus at gmail.com. If you have any questions, uh, whether it be about dermatology, which I did for 26 years, or medical history, feel free to go ahead and email me. And if there's a group ever interested in just getting together for a Zoom to discuss some aspects of medical history, I'm sure I can get one or two of our docents together and we can do that. And look forward to seeing you at the museum. If I'm free on July 1st, I certainly plan to be there. Thank you all for attending and hope you learned a little bit about what happened before today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it was, it was uh, quite frankly, Dr. Bob, terrifying. I'm really ex excited about the advances of medicine. Um, so thanks again for joining us today. Tomorrow's session, you guys, is actually going to be really cool. We have health career session. 
uh, with the public health officer in Yolo County and a public health program manager here in Sacramento. And we also have an awesome presentation about nursing careers. So if that's something that interests you, I highly recommend you attend. Don't forget, if you attend all sessions, you will be entered to uh, the drawing for the $100 Visa gift cards. Again, we have five to give away. So make sure you attend and that your name matches, um, your Zoom name matches the name that you registered with. And if you have any questions about today's session or future sessions, you can email Sam. Um, again, her email is in the chat or you can email me. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of your faces tomorrow. And you're all very welcome for all the thank yous. I thank you for the thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, have a good one. We'll see you